If you were choosing a house, and one was open plan, had picturesque views, 57 million square miles of land, five oceans, a breathable atmosphere, and meerkats, and the other house was a barren hellscape with poisonous soil, a poisonous atmosphere, a constant barrage of deadly cosmic radiation, and zero meerkats. I mean, you'd pick the nice one, right? Because you spent millions of years evolving to live there, and there's land galore, and plenty of resources, and if you treat it properly, it could be a veritable paradise, with humans and nature living in perfect harmony. Where the fuck are you going? But if you really insist on visiting Mars, then we'll have to get there. So, spacey school first, where you'll be treated to a variety of psychologists in your brain, and a variety of cameras up your ass. Then a ride up through the atmosphere on a barely controlled explosion. Bon voyage! Off we go then. Unless your spaceship uses spinny sci-fi rings, welcome to zero gravity, meaning you can now look forward to space adaptation syndrome. Or SAYUS! Your precious bodily fluids will now redistribute and puff your head up. Your lunch will probably pop out of your tummy for a second viewing. Your spine will now begin to stretch out by a few centimeters, let's see how that goes when you get back to gravity, and maybe debilitating kidney stones from your bones losing calcium, and cancerous radiation from cosmic rays. We are not made for space. On average, Mars is about 142 million miles from Earth, but every 26 months it gets close enough for humans to pop across. Traveling with current tech, that'll probably take around 7 months. And during that time, all of your food will be eaten from bags, no booze, obviously, and let's just hope you like drinking recycled piss. As the NASA motto goes, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. But that's not all, because confinement. You now inescapably share a double-decker bus with a bunch of potentially highly irritating humans for the next seven months. On top of that, all you have to look out the window at is little oodle-doodles on a black background interspersed with occasional breaks for a nice cup of piss java. On top of that, medical problems, dental issues, unexpected space pregnancy. The nearest hospital is millions of miles back the way you came. But assuming you've avoided technical failure, psychological failure, deadly micrometeoroids, hopefully you've made it to Mars. Pick a nice spot for landing and prepare for 10 minutes of terror. Even though the atmosphere of Mars is about 100 times less dense than Earth's, that means it's enough to burn stuff up, but not thick enough to make parachutes very effective. You'll need some variation of an aeroshell to protect the spacecraft booty, a parachute to slow things down a bit, and probably retro rockets to get to the surface undeaded. And if you still haven't gone mad, sad, or irradiated, and you set down alright, best of luck standing up, you've just got used to zero gravity, and now gravity is back. The world will go 10 tequila shots wibbly with your eyes fighting your vestibular system, your body thinks it's been poisoned. Vertigo and horrific nausea could go on for weeks. But if you can power through, snap a bootprint on the Martian surface for us idiots back home, 10 points to Gryffindor. Humanity has gone interplanetary. That's one small step for a suicidal astronaut. One giant leap for whoever happens to be into big, barren balls of sweet fuck all. Because that's where you are now. Great, you've made the history books, but that ain't gonna keep you alive. Now, maybe some robots went ahead of you and got a little crib ready, maybe not, but either way, you'll need your own breathable air, cause Mars don't have that. Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, that's the stuff we breathe out, not in, 3% nitrogen, or plant food, you are not a plant, and 2% argon. Now, maybe you can make oxygen from carbon dioxide using a process called electrolysis, but that is going to take lots of power, and unless you brought a nuclear reactor with you, or something. Good luck. Anyway, duties of yours will probably include scouting the area for prime real estate for those who come after you, a spot of geology, geography, and trying not to die. And get a load of your new hood. The tallest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, the largest canyon in the solar system, Valles Marineris, and hope your beach body is ready because maximum temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. Hope your beach coffin is ready because minimum is minus 140. A Mars day is only 37 minutes longer than ours. There'll also be four seasons seasons, just like Earth, and feel free to step outside and die in any of them. Oh, watch out for dust storms, they can get 20 miles high and spread across the entire planet for months on end. The Greeks called Mars's two moons fear and panic, and there's a reason for that. Now, we think there's still frozen water on Mars, maybe liquid water deep under the surface. Hopefully you found some of that, and hopefully it isn't full of deadly lurking pathogens. Talking of which, old Martian water might mean old Martian life, and how exciting if you found some of that. 
Possibly, yeah. Possibly, fuck no. Because if the remains of life are found, there's two possibilities. Either we confirm that it's an ancient ancestor of Earth life, meaning somehow we swapped microbes with Mars ages ago, and we're all descended from the same stuff. Interesting, for sure. Or there's no connection to Earth, meaning it's really real alien life. And one massive thing we don't know about the universe is how common is life just arising in the first place? Well, if the remains of alien life, even microbes, are found on Mars, that means life began independently on two out of eight planets in our solar system alone, or one in four. Pretty good odds. And if we apply those odds to the rest of the universe, there are probably at least thousands of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone, billions considering all the other galaxies, and that's nice, and that's swell, but if life is so common, where is everyone then? Where is anyone? Well, maybe alien life doesn't evolve into complex organisms very often. Or maybe it does, but civilizations wipe themselves out with some technology waiting for us a few hundred years into our own future. Or maybe someone is meticulously wiping them out. Something to rustle the existential jimmies in any case. Still, your launch window will come around in a few months. Off your trot. The next lot of human parasites to arrive might start thinking about actually sticking around for a while, as in permanent digs. And for them, radiation will be a big issue, courtesy of the sun and cosmic rays. All things being equal, humans on Mars would receive 50 times as much radiation as they would living on Earth. Lava tubes could be an idea. They're underground, that'll help. There might be some decent ones at a spot called Hellas Planitia, for example. And if humans can seal a section off and pressurize it, and with the help of a nuclear reactor, oxygen extraction from the atmosphere, etc. Yeah, maybe. Alternately, Mars is covered in crushed rock, regolith, everywhere. We don't know yet if you can make durable concrete from the stuff, would be neat for building with, but again, radiation. So some kind of protective shell would be needed if humans are living up top. And covering everything in a layer of regolith might do the trick for shielding solar and cosmic nasties. In any case, underground, overground, wombling free, if humans can find enough power, water, and protection from radiation, it won't be pretty living, but maybe, for whatever God forsaken reason anyone would live on Mars, it could be home. Now, making babies on Mars will not be a problem. There's enough gravity for that. Having babies, though, zzz, God knows what happens to a developing fetus on Mars, if conception is even possible. But this is all made up anyway, so assuming radiation hasn't damaged the mum or child during gestation, congratulations, it's a Martian, the first one ever. And just by being born, he or she will perhaps instantly become one of the most famous humans ever to exist. Talk about peaking early. Now, Mars is unlikely to be a state by then, so if maritime law applies, he or she will probably inherit the citizenship of their parents. All the same, the first ever native Martian will no doubt be adorable in that irritating baby way, tiny feetsies, tiny handsies, but with bones and a heart that will develop in Martian gravity. Just 38% of Earth's. They may never be able to visit Earth, not without some miraculous technology. Our gravity will be exhausting, possibly fatal. But if you're of a certain age, you know what happens when one of your mates has a baby, suddenly everyone wants one. Resource permitting, here come more little Martians then. Living effectively in a submarine is all they will know. And they'll be told stories, of course, of another planet, just over there somewhere, with oceans and zebras and skyscrapers, all beneath a benevolent blue sky. This will also probably signal a change in the colony from survivalists to homesteaders. They need teachers now, and pediatricians, and pharmacologists to cook up whatever brand of liquid morphine it is that stops new parents going fucking postal. They're generational. They're a proper settlement. And hopefully, with enough fertilizer and detoxification, Martian soil can support a crop yield to foster a growing population. Who knows? And what do Martians do all day anyway? Why would Earth have funded a Martian operation for so long? It really depends on what we find there. If rare resources are abundant, mining and export could be an option. Mars has less than half the gravity of Earth, and if rocket fuel can be made in abundance, interplanetary logistics, Mars to Earth, would be way cheaper than the other way around. Asteroid mining also wouldn't be the worst idea if we're going all sci-fi. Between Jupiter and Mars is our solar system's main asteroid belt. It's only about 4% the mass of Earth's moon, but full of iron and nickel, cobalt, vibranium, billions and billions of dollars worth of materials. And considering Mars is closer, and again easier to launch stuff into orbit from, could be the basis of an economy, maybe? 
But whatever happens next really depends on whether Martians can achieve energy independence from Earth. If they're forever relying on us for isotopes or materials, they'll forever be a satellite of the mother planet. If they don't have to though, that would be interesting, because they're 20 minutes away by radio and months away by rocket. And if you leave isolated settlers in one place, they do what humans always do – culture. Inventing new dialects, new traditions, and with that, a sense of independent Martian solidarity. They probably have their own flag and catchy anthems about how Mars is best this planet. Perhaps they'll start having little chats amongst themselves about how they're getting bored with the Earth supervision thing. But we know what happens when a distant state or multinational has an isolated group of people just where it wants them, and the issue of independence gets raised. The reply from corporate usually goes something like, Listen, you just keep doing, or producing, or exporting whatever it is of your we like so much, and in return you'll be more than fairly compensated with a tea break once a year, and pitifully small payment if any at all, and even more brutal working conditions. And if you don't like it, feel free to eat that big bag of dicks over there. And every now and then, if sufficiently irate, perhaps these isolated people respond, Thanks, that sounds great. Small digression though, about the tea. It's lovely with lemon, but yeah, we prefer it in the Boston Harbor, you fucks! Fifteen bucks, little man! Pay us fair and insert your solar trading company right up, your fundament! We want meerkats, and passports, and fuckloads of meerkats! We'll found our own Martian government with our own parliamentary shouty people and everything! And we'll do democracy better! We'll do brutality better! We'll fuck everything up better than you ever could! No one's had a bath in three generations! So take your quarterly reports and your taxation without representation, and fuck right off! Your ocean-hogging, atmosphere-breathing cucks! Ah, they grow up so fast. About three billion years ago, when the human race was a mere twinkle in Darwin's eye, it's likely that Mars had an ocean. Over time, the planetary core cooled, and the great magnet at the heart of the world shut down. And without a magnetic field for protection, solar winds began to attack, stripping away the atmosphere while the water below was evaporated, as life flourished next door for 3,000 million years. But if we make the trip there sometime soon, though the first settlers to Mars may arrive in hell, they would surely prefer Eden. Can we do that? Can we bring a planet back from the dead? Well, no, probably not us, we're barely managing the house we grew up in. But our kids 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 might give it a go, if the technology is there. For starters, they would need to recreate Mars's long dead magnetic field, its magnetosphere. And one fun and pleasantly insane idea for this is engineering a torus, or donut, of plasma around the planet by firing off particles from Phobos, Mars's larger moon. But this stuff is all probably science for later this century, or the next. And even with magnetic shielding, the atmosphere is thinner than airline toilet paper and too chilly for humans anyway. Well, a bit of global warming then? CO2 and CFCs are terrible for our atmosphere, but released into Mars's atmosphere by the kiloton would be one way to thicken and warm things up. But even then, if the air is nice and toasty, we still can't breathe it. Cyanobacteria gifted Earth with oxygen via photosynthesis, but that took millions and millions of years. Even if cyanobacteria is capable of living on Mars, or genetically engineered algae or something, making Mars air breathable with photosynthesis is likely to take centuries, if not a millennium, if not longer. Though if it's possible. Perhaps as back on Earth we grimly mark the successive milestones of environmental decline, our Martian cousins will watch their world for the opposite. The first cloud, the first rains, the first blade of grass and anthill, the first lover's picnic outside, the first Martian generation to consider themselves not as stalwart settlers, but Earth's equals. Full terraforming may just not be possible. Some areas of science are dead ends. There's a reason alchemy jobs are so hard to come by these days. But from our current vantage point in history, there is a case for the possibility of resurrecting Mars. And wherever else humans of the solar system go, whatever else we turn into, however much better or worse human existence becomes, with any kind of permanent self-sufficient settlement on Mars, a single delicate cell of planetary civilization will have divided in two with the terrible burden of cosmic survival carried on two backs now, making the weight lighter for both. There's a good bit near the end of the movie 2010. 
when the story is almost wrapped up and non-corporeal, omnipotent aliens deign to communicate with humanity just once. A message addressed to all of us and paraphrased, the message reads, All these worlds are yours. Use them together. Use them in peace. Hi! Thanks for staying until the bitter end. I wrote a story a while ago called Geometry for Ocelots, and just a mere year after the ebook came out, it's a paperback now too. There's a link below if you want to get hold of the paperback. There's a link below if you don't. It works equally well as a doorstop, a beverage mat, and perhaps a tarpaulin for any itinerant mice passing through your premises. It's a thousand year long war between a religious empire and a scientific empire, really. But with Buddhism and transhumanism along for the ride. Sorry it took a while to get into print, but of all the stories I've written, this is one of them. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're keeping well. I hope your gut bacteria are in good health. I hope you recently enjoyed a game of backgammon. I hope you're on the verge of emerging from a personal crisis. I hope the air temperature is optimal wherever you happen to be on the planet. I hope you found your purpose in life. I hope you've worked out what was in the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. I hope you recently encountered a cat.